On April 18, 1942, Colonel Jimmy Doolittle led a daring surprise raid on Japan. After hitting targets in five cities, his B-25 bombers ran out of fuel over China, forcing the crews to bail out or crash land. While most of them made it to safety in Chongqing, eight airmen were captured by the Japanese. Jake DeShazer was one of them. After being held briefly in China, they were flown to Tokyo. It was the beginning of a long journey from which half of them would not return. The military police uh, interrogated us for, oh, I imagine 15 days, day and night, without sleep or anything, you know. And uh, they had all five of my crew were captured, of course, and uh, three others from uh, crew number six. They would hold us down and pour water down our nose, that sort of thing. They tried everything, I guess, and uh, would make threatening gestures and all of that. They were tortured, they were starved, they were put in solitary confinement, they were beaten, they were kicked, they were done about everything you can think of so to somebody. And they treated their prisoners awful because in the Japanese society, a prisoner was the worst. You die as a warrior. Japanese soldiers believed it was better to die than surrender. They would fight to the death or commit suicide before being captured. It was the way of honor. To get captured is bad, and so they treated their prisoners much worse, frankly, than the Germans did. So they beat them, and they tortured them, and they, they, they kicked them around, and they didn't get, very few people lived. A month after the raid, Jimmy Doolittle was promoted to Brigadier General and received the Congressional Medal of Honor from President Roosevelt. My grandfather never felt he deserved that. He never felt he earned it. So in his heart and his mind, and he told President Roosevelt that medal belonged to all of the Raiders, to Jake, to Bobby, to everybody. That same day, the Raiders who had returned to the United States received the Distinguished Flying Cross in ceremonies at Bowling Field. And for the first time, the American public heard news of the Doolittle Raid. Militarily, the raid had a great psychological effect, negative on the Japanese. They were infuriated that they had been attacked. We were exhilarated by the whole thing happening. And the news was released. It was just the greatest news that any of us could have had, any American could have had. On May 21st, Jake's mother received a telegram from the mayor of Pendleton, Oregon, inviting her to attend a celebration for the raiders who trained there. She wired back, we'll be glad to come if my boy is there. Please wire collect whether or not he is. The mayor replied, your boy will not be here. Although there was no official mention that eight men were prisoners of the Japanese, Jimmy Doolittle knew, and he was pursuing every military and diplomatic means to find them. He would never stop looking for his men who were left behind. The Shays in that gang took a real hit. I mean, they were punished bad, beaten and tortured and, and starved and uh, humiliated. They were interrogated hours on end, and uh, they, the treatment was just uh, inhumane. After weeks of questioning and deprivation, the eight men signed personal history statements written in Japanese. These would later be used against them as confessions of war crimes against the Japanese people during the raid. From Tokyo, they were taken to a military prison in Shanghai and placed in a common cell. 
Exhausted by dysentery and malnutrition, they were at a low ebb when Lieutenant Chase Nielsen rallied their spirits. Chase was a, was a tough guy. He's the one in prison who said uh, when they feed it, when he got some rice and it was full of worms, and the other guys threw the stuff back at, at the Japanese and kicked it around the cell. They weren't going to eat that stuff. He looked at it and he says, those little things have got protein in them. I'm going to eat them because I'm coming back to tell them what these people are doing to us. In August 1942, the eight Americans were moved to a maximum security prison outside Shanghai before a military court whose proceedings were all in Japanese. They were tried and convicted of crimes against humanity for their part in the Doolittle Raid. And they'd accuse us of bombing and strafing uh, civilian areas and stuff. So that was their so-called uh, court-martial. They were classified as war criminals and sentenced to death. Two months later, Lieutenants Bill Farrow and Dean Hallmark, along with Sergeant Harold Spatz, were brought before a Japanese firing squad. We thought we were going to all be executed, but they reprieved uh, us to life in prison with special treatment that if they won the war, we'd be kept as slave labor. If we won the war, we'd be shot. That was the final court martial. We really did not know what happened to them. Didn't know where they were. There was no way that the word could have gotten out because they were in Japanese prisons in China. And uh, the security was very tight, especially for them. Sometimes while Jake was a prisoner, my mother and father would sit down to eat and as was customary, would bow their heads in prayer. And my dad would say, so they told me, I wonder if Jake has anything to eat. And he said that it often resulted in nobody eating. But they did take me to that movie. And so it became clear to me. And then I, I sensed my mother's grieving, yeah, sense of sorrow for her brother. Months on end, months on end, and uh, prayers constantly, yeah, yeah. We were prisoners for 40 months, and 36 of those months were in solitary confinement. So. Solitary confinement was uh, something that took uh, maybe all of the time we were in solitary confinement to get used to. <laughs> it was a pretty uh, weird feeling. Boredom, being isolated, being in cells all by yourself and uh, eating rats and bugs and, and uh, getting kicked around and not being able to talk to each other to sit in a cell by yourself, staring at a wall. You can't see outside. There might be windows up there about eight feet high that you can't see out of. All you know is whether maybe it's day or night, and that's all you know. And sit there and stare at the wall for hours at a time. What happens to your mind? What do you do with the time? You remember, uh back to your childhood days and every, every, nearly every occasion in life that meant anything to you, you know, you spend time thinking in that manner.
When a Japanese photograph appeared in Time magazine, Jake's family was startled. His brother Glenn said, that's Jake all right, and he looks mad. But they did not know that the photo had been taken a year before and that two of the men shown had been executed. The remaining five raiders had been secretly moved to a military prison in Nanking. There, on December 1st, 1943, Lieutenant Robert Meter died from beriberi and malnutrition. He had been uh, ill and kind of hurting for several days. And, and uh, we got outside to exercise, you know, about 10 or 15 minutes a day. We kind of helped him get back in his cell. And uh, one of the guards kind of pushed him and he said, hey, as weak as I am, I can still beat your butt. <laughs> and, but he was, and we were helping him and, you know, he was a great guy. Uh, the Japanese uh, took us into his cell and let us pass by his casket. They had him in a wooden box and then afterwards they cremated him. And uh, his box got back home. And uh, the ones that were executed, we got their ashes also in the end. Meter's death concerned the Japanese prison officers who ordered improved treatment for the remaining four. They received an extra blanket, better food, and something they had longed for, books. One of those books was a Bible. And all four of them were allowed to read the Bible, but they were allowed to keep it only about three weeks maximum and pass it on to another one. But the Bible affected every one of those four men. And I think that that uh, was a turning point for each of them. The 23rd Psalm was a, a pretty good starting point. But we tried to read the whole Bible through. And of course, the Gospels were the important thing. Jake was deeply impressed with the words of Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. On June 8, 1944, Jake bowed his head and spoke to God. Lord, you know all things. You know I do repent of my sins. Even though I am far from home and though I am in prison, I must have forgiveness. Jake uh, had been a, his family had been Christians, but he was a disbeliever until he got that Bible and he, he read that Bible and really I guess the Holy Spirit just took over his, life, his whole thinking. So it was a kind of a terrific uh, meaning to me at the time because we had, at outside at exercise, we had both confided that we had really believed in the Lord Jesus. The summer of 1944 was the hottest on record in Nanking, and the following winter was the coldest. On Christmas Day, the four raiders were jubilant when American planes bombed an oil refinery nearby. But the planes did not come back, and life returned to month after month of boredom and monotony. Then, in June 1945, they were abruptly moved to a prison in Peking. So we were blindfolded and handcuffed and leg cuffed and everything and uh, they carried us by train and they had two guards per person. Alone in small cells, each man was forced to sit on a narrow stool and face the wall. They had no news of the outside world to tell them why their situation had become worse or that things were about to change dramatically. When the guards were occupied, Jake and Bobby Height could communicate briefly by talking through the Benjo, a common receptacle toilet shared by their adjoining cells. 
we would take the lid off and yell through the to one another. And I said, Jake, what was the matter? And he said, Bobby, I was praying this morning and the war is going to be over today. He said it was revealed to me. I think it was uh, the 9th of August. Uh, the Japanese were asking funny questions and doing kind of funny things. And I think it was on the 13th and 14th, they gave us shave and haircut and all of that. And that was a little bit unusual. And they were just acting a, a not normal, you know, the normal routine of coming by ourselves and checking us. On the 17th of August, a seven-man OSS team parachuted into a Japanese airfield near Peking. Their mission was to accept the surrender of the Japanese and to be sure that all prisoners of war in that area were released. Their translator was Dick Hamada, a Japanese-American from Hawaii. The two little Tokyo Raiders were prisoners and it so happened that when we parachuted, they were in Peking. So we were really concerned about what was gonna happen to us. We thought they were, well, they're gonna shoot us. And on the 20th, uh, they knocked on our cell doors and said, okay, we're gonna, they took us all out and uh, said, uh, we're gonna let you go home because our hearts are so kind. <laughs> They were released to Major Ray Nichols and three officers of the OSS team. After 40 months as prisoners of war, it all seemed like a dream. So they put us on the back of a truck and carried us to a hotel and that's where they had other people that had been prisoners of the Japanese. And uh, we found out that we were actually free and the Japanese had uh, surrendered. They were all skinny, underfed like, you know, but they were healthy except for Lieutenant George Bow who could not walk. He was, he was really ill. First meal we had after we got out of prison camp, when we got in the Hotel de Gink in Peking, the British prisoners in there had cooked up some Irish stew. And I'm telling you, that was mighty good too. On the Night, night before their departure, we invited all the prisoners to join us in a little party. We had pie, we had cake, we had milk, we had everything. I'll never forget it. It was kind of a, a joyful thing to know that really we were going to get to return. They were flown to Chongqing in western China where an armed forces radio reporter discovered that Jake had not lost his sense of humor. Hello, Corporal. Hello, I'm Sergeant now. You're a Sergeant now. <laughs> my, my, my error. It's a long, hard way to make Sergeant, but I finally made it. <laughs> From Walter Reed Hospital, Jake wrote to his parents, quote, God spoke to me when I was in solitary confinement, and I want to go to a missionary school and go back and help the Oriental people when I get a good education. I learned to pray and obey God in solitary cells. It was long enough to learn how to think. I'm truly thankful for every prayer you have prayed for me and for all your care and patience and forgiveness. He soon told us that he intended to go back to Japan as a missionary. And that was quite amazing. Six weeks after Jake's return, he was out of the Army and enrolled at Seattle Pacific College. Going from prison to the classroom was quite an adjustment itself. But people wanted to hear his story of captivity and conversion to Christ. Every weekend, he spoke in a church or auditorium with overflow crowds. They had him at Youth for Christ, and he appeared during the program, very thin man, 
halting speech because he'd been in confinement so long. And uh, they interviewed him. For what he'd been through, I think he surprised him, surprised us all with his response to any question that was given to him. And that was kind of typical of Jake. I think he surprised a lot of people in his presentations. Jake was serious about his education, but he soon noticed Florence Matheny from Toddville, Iowa, a former teacher who wanted to be a missionary. Florence is a person who was always ready with a smile, always positive, jolly, ready for a joke, and a great, great talker. So we made a good pair because we both like to talk. He came to school in 1945, and that's when I first knew him. His diction wasn't very good yet. He talked in a monotone because he'd been in solitary confinement for so long. Well, he was skinny, and, he, and his hair was all chopped off. Uh, but I thought he's, he's headed the right direction. We did.